Um, thank you so much, and uh, thanks uh, to uh, Sophie and Kimber for, uh, for inviting me. Um, so I was uh, asked to speak on uh, something that was uh, more India relevant, and, uh, and of course the cost of an action comes next. So, uh, so I, I figured I'd focus on just this one thing, and uh, you know, particular studies that are ongoing right now, um, and uh, and and uh, try to summarize uh, you know where things stand uh, with respect to child development uh, from the economic side. Um, now, as, as most of you know, there's uh, 27 million kids born each year in, uh, in India. And uh, if you look at the Grantham McGregor paper, 65 million of those 200 million kids who are disadvantaged by year five are in India. Uh, so that's roughly one in three. And uh, just for comparison, the number of kids who die under five each year in India is about one and a half million. So uh, large numbers for sure. Now, India has done quite well in child survival. Uh, it won't reach MDGs uh, for, for survival, but it certainly has made a significant uh, uh, amount of gain. Uh, and, but it certainly lags on child development. So uh, this is from the Commission on Investing in Health, uh, uh, the, the report that came out quite recently. And this is 1997 on the left side, and then uh, this is 2032 projected on the right side. You can see that uh, all huge amount of the averted deaths are going to be in that uh, zero to four category, uh, quite significant and, uh, and certainly shifting um, the distribution. So India's infant mortality rate is about 47 per thousand and uh, about a third of the kids are low birth weight. India has high rates of stunting, about 42% of the under five kids in India are overweight, uh, uh, sorry, underweight, 48% are stunted and, uh, and a lot of them are anemic. Huge variations of cross, across states, of course, because uh, you know, states like Kerala do reasonably well uh, on under five mortality, but then you've got uh, states like Madhya Pradesh that continue to lag behind. Now, I want to spend a couple of minutes on this. I, uh, you know, Peter actually mentioned this. In fact, I sent this to him a few years ago uh, from The Economist. And this was a very interesting report that uh, was done by Partha Dasgupta, uh, and this was an idea of inclusive wealth. Uh, the idea that countries have, we measure GDP often in countries, which is income, but we don't really stop back to measure wealth. How much is the country really worth at the moment? And if you want the entire inclusive wealth report, it was out in 2012, it's, it's, it's downloadable uh, you know, from some website. But this was an economist uh, you know, picture that summarized this. And you can see that if you look at a country like Japan, most of their wealth is in human capital, very little in natural capital. And the physical capital is, you know, physical capital being, you know, physical infrastructure, roads, uh, you know, uh, uh, all of that stuff. The natural capital is, is minerals on the ground, environment, air quality to some extent. Human capital, I'll tell you in just a second, but it's really to do with education, attainment, productivity, uh, wages, health, life expectancy, and so forth. So Japan, obviously, uh, heavily concentrated on human capital. Uh, and you can see countries, perhaps, like, you know, Canada has probably more of the natural capital, as does Norway and Australia. Uh, but then by the time you get down to a country like India, it actually, or even if you take Saudi Arabia, the natural capital is going to outweigh the, um, uh, the, the human capital, and certainly the natural and physical outweighs the human. Uh, India, for instance, is somewhere out there, and India, as you can imagine, is probably in the main report, has uh, a relatively smaller amount in, in the human capital uh, category. Now, measuring it in this way is useful because when I was listening to the discussion yesterday, the thing about moving from child deaths to child development is just hugely complex, right? Because one is, uh, is binary and the other one is, is so complicated that the idea of having constructed even consistent measures that are consistent across countries would be quite hard to do. Now. This is what this report used, so essentially population mortality, probability, uh, employment, education attainment, uh, employment compensation, so wages, labor force participation, population, and so forth. This is still not a full measure in a sense of, of anything that you would consider child development, but these are the indicators that you might think that child development would eventually uh, reflect upon. So if you did well on child development, then all of these should actually improve. And these are all, in a sense, measurable, they're obviously not proximal, they're distal, and they're multifactorial. But at least it gives us a sense for what we're really aiming for, which is the goal at the end is really to improve human capital or the human potential. And those we really can measure, even if we can't uh, necessarily measure everything that's going on uh, in a more proximal sense. This is from a book called Happiness by Laird, uh, 
which uh, some of you may have read. And this is the distribution of, of you know, self-reported happiness. And this is uh, you know, per capita GDP. And you can see that if you look at just income, you can see that that increases, happiness increases with income a fair bit and then flattens out. Uh, over, you know, after that. Now, we're constructing something like this which is more health related. I haven't found one yet, but at least the preliminary estimates we have is that this actually does, it, it isn't the flattening out, it actually does go up at, a, at uh, because, because uh, income and, and health are not necessarily perfectly correlated. You might not necessarily see this, uh, this L shape, or a reverse L, L shape curve if you did it that way. Now, going back to India, percentage of children under three uh, who are underweight or stunted. Uh, there have been uh, improvements uh, in, uh, in stunting and underweight, but certainly not the pace that, uh, that one would consider acceptable. Now, this, is, this is persists over the entire uh, you know, zero to, uh, to 60 months, the first, uh, the first five years of life. And uh, it's, it's a pretty persistent pattern. And this is more recent data from, uh, from Vinod Paul and others from The Lancet. So if you look at a country like Vietnam, for instance, uh, they brought down their child malnutrition at an annual rate of about 3.5% you know, between uh, those 20 years. And India's rate of decline over that, say, just the 90s was just about a little less than a percent. So other countries have done vastly better. And in fact, we look at uh, Nepal and Bangladesh, which is just right next door. They have done much better on child nutrition than, than India has. So uh, clearly an area that is, uh, that is an important target. What has India done in response? Uh, there's now a new, I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a, in a future slide, but, but a lot of money being spent on food and food security. Uh, the proposed, there's an, now a plan to spend uh, roughly $20 billion a year on a Right to Food Act, which is essentially about food security, essentially supplying carbohydrates, which is going to do wonders for obesity, of course. Uh, now, child malnutrition, it turns out that the, the correlation with income is not as, you might, uh, as, as strong as you might think. A third of kids in the richest income quintile are actually underweight. And that suggests that child malnutrition is not as strongly related to food insecurity as you might think. There are probably other environmental factors at work as well. And there's also not been much of a dent on, on hunger. So the number of hungry people in India has been fairly consistent uh, over time, even though uh, agricultural productivity has been uh, pretty robust over the last couple of decades. So here's a summary picture. Crop yields have increased. So average crop yields of all food grains and cereals uh, over the last 40 years. And you, you know, arguably quite a strong performance there, both in food grains and coarse cereals. Now, calorie intake, uh, intake has actually declined in India. Hard to explain why, but this, is, uh, this has been a you know, fairly consistent story uh, for the rural areas and, and one of these conundrums. And there's actually no discernible link between the crop yield and the calorie intake. So, well, you know, the first and the second pictures put this together, which is it isn't as if we can sort of solve this problem simply by producing more food. That's not really where the solution lies. So there's lots of conundrums about child undernutrition in India. Uh, it's stagnated, even though cell phone rates have, uh, have increased dramatically. So I think there's a cell phone, uh, you know, for every two Indians at this point. And the question is, why do the poor, even when given the opportunity, choose to spend the money on, on cell phones or, or other luxury durables when uh, their kids' nutrition is really at stake? Or you know, I, I use nutrition as a proxy for broader things that they could be doing for, for child development. And it's hard to figure out why it is that, uh, that this is really not making the progress that it should. Maybe India doesn't have enough economists to explain uh, to people that, that there's long-term growth potential, and maybe we need to, uh, to clone Paul Gertner and sprinkle him across the country to make the, the excellent presentation that he, just, uh, that he just gave. But this is perhaps something which, uh, which needs to be addressed. Why is it that people don't really appreciate that this is something that, that their households would gain from? And uh, I, I think, Peter, you were talking about Vishwajit Kumar saying, you know, people uh, care about their kids not surviving but thriving, but they don't seem to want to do anything to make their kids thrive, even though they have the financial resources to do it. So uh, there's certainly a, a mismatch between what they want and, uh, and what they actually end up doing. Um, or the other part which is entirely, uh, well, not very possible that economists are wrong, that maybe our assessments of economic growth potential are completely off the mark. Maybe 
on the nutrition is not as big a deal and maybe the people are smarter and, and we're just dumb about uh, thinking that all of these huge wage gains that you get from reducing stunting are exist. Maybe they just don't exist and that, then people are responding rationally. Um, so that puts us in a tough spot because we want to believe that people behave rationally. We also want to believe that our numbers are right and those two can't be right at the same time. So, um, so this is a huge uh, loss of child development potential in India and of course uh, you know, this is not an Indian study. This is put by Tom Vogel in, in General Development Economics, and I think uh, this, is, this is going to be said a million times at this meeting. Uh, the link between height and, and log uh, hourly earnings or years of education. Uh, I think there's fairly good consistent data from around the world which shows a positive uh, uh, correlation between, uh, between height and, uh, and cognitive scores, self-reported health status, et cetera. So this is just one slide that essentially summarizes this. Now, in fact, as, as, uh, as Paul just mentioned, this early height is actually a good predictor of what might happen later. So if you look at height for age at two years at height later on in life for adults, uh, you can see that uh, essentially if you're taller at that age, then you're going to be taller at, uh, so you have roughly three uh, centimeter height gain or oh, height advantage at, at, at adulthood, and this is uh, across countries. Um, and uh, height, height for age at, at two years is also a good predictor of, uh, of attained schooling. So about a half a year uh, greater mean change in schooling. And in fact, I'm going to show you some results from India which show roughly the same thing. Now, this is years of schooling. It doesn't necessarily mean improvement in, uh, in being able to read or doing anything because just the fact that you go to school for half a year more and the school is terrible and the teacher doesn't show up doesn't mean that you actually uh, you know, benefit from going to school. But certainly the kids do go to school more. So height is a good proxy for this early uh, life environment and that's what I'm going to use next. Uh, to, and there's you know, a fairly strong consistent relationship between this and, and birth weight with uh, the education earnings and health status and I think uh, we all agree on that by now. Um, but, of course, as, I think as someone mentioned yesterday quite uh, appropriately, the estimates of early life health shocks may be biased because of mortality selection. And we haven't done a good job of really estimating that and to see whether the people who actually survive are somehow different than the ones who, uh, uh, because, you know, we're, we're keeping kids alive more now and does that actually uh, downward bias or upward bias uh, the folks actually do survive. Now, turning a little bit to the programmatic side, now, India does spend a lot of money on child development, and uh, the bottom line is that these pay off when implemented well. Now, this is spending on key programs, so it's about a $10 billion on this direct food subsidy this year. It's going to go up to about $20 billion in the next couple of years. Uh, and uh, health spending overall is about $6 billion a year. The ICDS program, Integrated Child Development Services, which I'll talk about in a second, is about $3 billion midday meal scheme two, and uh, rural drinking water and sanitation. Now, these don't look like large numbers. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Montgomery County, which is next door, has, a, has an annual budget of about $5 billion. But for India, these are actually pretty large numbers. Um, now, ICDS, so as much as we're talking about translating what, what we're saying about child development into, into a government program, uh, uh, some, someone in the Indian bureaucracy must have had this right a long time ago because this started back in 1975. The idea that you had to integrate child development and it had to include nutrition, uh, early education, etc. And so ICDS is now, uh, what is it, it's almost uh, 40 years old. It will be 40 next year and that's, uh, that's pretty significant. It was uni universalized in 2005. Uh, 1.2 million Anganwadi centers, which is where every village uh, or, or uh, you know, two villages have one of these centers. Uh, 92 million uh, beneficiaries, uh, 30, 35.5 million preschool education beneficiaries, uh, $3.2 billion budget, as I mentioned, and uh, there's a center for every 800 people. And most villages actually do have a center. Now, this is all the things that ICDS does do. So it provides a supplementary nutrition uh, both what you uh, what the child may eat at the center uh, if they're three to six years and a take home if they're younger than that and if, uh, if they're pregnant and lactating mothers. So some of you may have been to these. Where they work, they're actually impressive. They seem to work quite well. That's where people show up for immunizations, uh, health checkups, referrals, uh, preschool education and health and nutrition education. So a lot of the things that you might want as a child development program are all built into this and have existed there for a long time. Now the take-home ration is, is variable across states, but it's usually some sort of a porridge mix. 
which has uh, you know rice, wheat, lentils, and soy all fortified and so forth. Uh, not to say that all this stuff works perfectly, of course. I don't have to say that at all. But uh, you know, there's uh, um, you know there've been uh, any number of scams associated with the procurement of uh, of uh, of these rations in in various states. Uh, but you know, some states it does actually work well. So Tamil Nadu or Kerala may be a place that it actually does work well. So this is what uh, these ICDS centers look like. Uh, and uh, there's been some work on, uh, on impact of ICDS programs that boys are 5% less likely to be underweight if there is an ICDS center, uh, Jane's study on, on them being taller on average. Now, we've done some of this work, so I see a red light. Is that actually, am I supposed to pay attention to this? Okay. Uh, I thought we'd turn that off <laughs> so, for the session. So uh, there's observation data on beneficiaries, but there's, uh, there's obviously selection bias. People who are in, in places with ICDS may have other things going on that are different from people who are in more remote areas, don't have an ICDS center. And there's also large variations in ICDS quality. Um, now, just the, we use the, the NFHS data, which essentially has data on people, whether they were at this last point, which is whether an individual has lived a whole life in a given place and whether they were exposed to the local ICDS center during the first three years of life. And what we find, bottom line, is that having an ICDS center does have about 0.6 years of schooling. Uh, it actually does have a very small improvement in reading score. Uh, and so, so these are uh, statistically significant, not for any of the others. Um, so ICDS does seem to, uh, to, uh, to, to work when actually implemented. Now, to supplement that, we actually looked at a different trial, which is sort of like the Guatemala trial, which is the Hyderabad Nutrition Trial, which was done in, uh, uh, in 1987 to 1990. Fifteen villages randomized uh, to an intervention, which was a food supplement of UPMA for uh, pregnant women, mothers, and children, and then looking at 14 control villages. And the idea was to study the impact on birth weight of the infant, and this is what the, the trial design looked like. And a lot of these folks were re-enrolled uh, about 25 years later by Sanjay Kindra, who was looking at basically lower cardiovascular risk. And what he found was that the adolescents who had been exposed to the program were both about 14 millimeters taller and had lower cardiovascular risk. Um, and uh, so this is now called the APGAP study. It still continues with Wellcome Trust funding. And the next stage will be, uh, will be on looking at uh, perhaps education outcomes and even wage outcomes for some of these folks who would have, uh, would have been uh, uh, who would have been uh, in the study, and remarkably little dropout. So this was the height uh, advantage, and this was also the the uh, the, the fat-free mass index advantage that was that accrued to kids who were enrolled in the trial. Uh, and here again, we looked at current enrollment, and this is uh, and we see a positive effect about you know it's pretty small, but still there's a the, the treatment uh, villages had kids who were more, uh, uh, more likely to be enrolled uh, in programs than, uh, than kids in the control village. And uh, a smaller statistical significance for, uh, for attainment. So the bottom line is that ICDS and these kinds of early nutrition programs, when they work uh, or when they're implemented, seem to have an effect on school enrollment, but not really on attainment or test score that we can tell. Uh, but you know, school attainment also depends on supply side factors, which is infrastructure and, uh, and of course, demand for schooling. Uh, so all of these are, are important as well. Now, just quickly to go into the Anganwadi centers and the ICDS program, turns out that there's not that many vacant positions. So most of these Anganwadi centers uh, are, are actually staffed reasonably well across India. So this is, uh, this is good news and surprisingly good news. However, most of their supervisor positions are not staffed. So essentially, these folks are working around the country. No one really knows what they're doing uh, unless you know, there's a periodic visit. And when you have half of their supervisors not being around, and uh, it's no secret that many of these positions are also sort of auctioned off, then you don't have the program effects that you really want. Last point I'll make is that what we really need is these sorts of multi-sectoral interventions. There's a lot of interest and work in India now on on, uh, on open defecation and reducing open defecation. Dean Spears has done some interesting work here, which is on access to toilets and correlation with height for age. Uh, this is still early stuff, but still it's, uh, I, I don't think anyone argues with the fact that reducing open defecation or the, you know, the roughly 400 million uh, plus Indians who, who, uh, who don't have access to, uh, to toilets or don't use them, 
uh, that's a situation that needs to change. This was an interesting last slide which I show up, which is a study which, uh, which comes from a, a more recent paper by Dean and, and other folks, um, which is that Muslims actually face a lower child mortality rate in India than Hindus, even though Muslim parents are typically poorer and less educated on average. Uh, but they find that there's actually uh, there's a significant difference in sanitation and open defecation, and that accounts for 18% of the child mortality gap between Hindus and Muslims. So, just to say that you know we, we need to be looking when you're looking at child development, not just looking at ICDS type programs, which even when they work, you're going to get about a centimeter growth advantage and a half year schooling. But some of these other kinds of uh, you know I, I'm not suggesting that people need to change religion, but really look at uh, you know, defecation or looking at women's empowerment, these broader, uh, more difficult to deal with uh, environmental factors, uh, maybe, or the, you know, the more distal factors might be the places to look for, uh, for doing something here. And there's probably a limit to what we can do through the direct interventions. Uh, this again is, you know, looking at fraction of total area uh, that was Muslim and, and the infant mortality rate. I mean, these look surprisingly uh, good. Um, and it's still a working paper, but uh, you know, I thought I'd, I'd put that out there. So summary is all the stuff I've said, India lags on child development, has done well on child survival, although more needs to be done there. But I think you'll see more as immunization coverage goes up and so forth. Uh, and also the neonatal mortality uh, will start uh, you know, hopefully uh, dropping there as well. Now high rates of stunting and poor nutritional status, that's, that's a huge problem. There's a lot of money being spent and, but there's uh, variable quality of the program, uh, and uh, there's certainly a lot more attention on the multi-sectoral interventions. ICDS performance is one aspect of it, but dealing with water sanitation and other issues uh, might be a part of this puzzle. So uh, I want to thank um, uh, some of the folks who have supported this work, uh, including Saving Brains, and of course, uh, um, uh, some of this work is also through the Disease Control Priorities Project, which was mentioned yesterday. And, uh, and our collaborators in both of these, including Jerry, who will be talking more about this in the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ramanan. That was a nice um, dance between agriculture, nutrition, ECD, water and sanitation, and behavior change, which I think is a pretty key factor that we haven't necessarily looked at that, mu that much. How do we foment the revolution with the policymakers, but also the family caregivers? Next, we have Norbert Shadi from the Inter-American Development Bank. 